Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Woods. I'm from Purdue University. And this is joint work with my co-author, Stanton Hodger, who's currently at Baylor University. And this paper is entitled, Behavioral Bandits, Analyzing the Exploration versus Exploitation Trade-off in the Lab. So to get into the introduction, we're gonna to have to talk about what this exploration versus exploitation trade-off actually is. So the dilemma of whether to explore an unfamiliar option or exploit a familiar option is pervasive in real world decision-making. So I've got some examples here. The one I'm gonna focus on is in the middle because it's more appropriate for an academic audience. So say you have some new research idea or research ag agenda that's quite ambitious. You might need to decide whether to put your effort into that new agenda or to stick to the areas you know. So the benefits of the new idea is that it might yield you some really good publications, but the downside is you're not really sure if the idea is actually going to work out or whether it's gonna be popular or whatnot. Whereas if you stick to the research agenda you know, you know the idea actually works, you're very familiar with it, and you'll get some publications, but they might not be uh, you know, as good as the other idea. So this trade-off is modeled by the single agent exponential bandit, and the single agent exponential bandit forms the basis for many other theoretical models. And if you don't believe me, I've got a list here of various applications and papers that use the exponential bandit as a sort of bedrock of that theory. So if it's the case that this trade-off is really pervasive in real world decision making and also underlies a lot of our theoretical work, then it's really important that we understand each facet of how this trade-off actually operates. So to do that, what we do is we test the single agent exponential bandit model in a lab experiment. So what we do is we implement this model in the lab and for the treatments, we vary one parameter in isolation from some baseline set of parameters. And we do that in such a way that we expect to see a similar increase in behavior for those different parameters. So from our experiment, we do find uh, support for the comparative statics of the model, but we also find persistent under exploration. And that's kind of problematic if you think about the real world application of this, because that would mean that a whole bunch of good ideas are going undiscovered. And we also find different behavior depending on which parameter we've changed. That's despite the fact that the standard model is predicting the same increase in behavior. So what we propose is that various behavioral factors might be influencing behavior in this environment. So in particular, we conjecture that utility curvature base rate neglect or conservatism and belief updating and nonlinear probability weighting could all be influencing exploration. So what we do is we propose and fit a structural model that incorporates these factors. And from that model, we find support for risk aversion, conservatism and inverse s shape probability weighting. And of those three parameters, we find that risk aversion appears to be the main driver of the under exploration that we're seeing. So we'll dive into the theory Time's gonna be continuous and has future payoffs discounted at rate R, it's fairly standard so far. And the individual at each point in time needs to decide between one or two actions. It needs to decide between a safe action and a risky action. Now the safe action always yields the payoff S, whereas the risky action can either be good or bad. And the agent must experiment with the risky action to find out which of those states it actually is. So a good risky action is gonna pay out this lump sum I'm gonna denote as H at random times. Otherwise it doesn't pay out anything. Whereas the bad risky action always pays out zero. So it never pays H. So the safe action is preferred to the bad risky action, but the good risky action is preferred uh, to the safe action. So basically the agent has some incentive to actually experiment to find out is the risky action actually good. So the current belief that the risky action is good is going to evolve from the initial prior as you experiment with that risky action. So basically, if you're pulling on that risky action lever, if you're not observing any of these lump sum H's, then your belief that the true state is actually good is going to be decreasing and how it does that is with Bayes rule. Whereas if you ever see one of those lump sums of H, then you know the true state must be good because the bad state always pays out zero. So what a subject should do in this experiment is start out by experimenting with the risky action and you should keep doing that until his belief goes below some cutoff belief where 
he wants to then switch to the safe action. So you can calculate that cutoff belief by equating the expected payoff flows of obviously the risky action and the safe action. And that's how you get this particular formulation here. I've color coded some things, it'll become more obvious later on. So the interesting uh, behavior that we're into is the willingness to experiment in the absence of a reward. So how long are you gonna pull on that risky level without seeing H before you stop, give up, go to the safe action? So in other words, it's gonna be the time taken to reach that cutoff belief here. And we've got an explicit sort of functional form here for that. So this is the behavior we're interested in. And now we can derive some comparative statics. So in particular, the willingness to experiment increases when we either decrease the safe payout, increase the discount rate, or increase the initial prior. And this is why I've got the color coded here. Now you can change other parameters, but these are the ones we're gonna focus on in the experiment. So that's why I'm going over them. Uh, so the first way we can increase experimentation is to decrease the safe payoff. So as you can see, that affects the cutoff belief. So what you've done here is you've made the safe action less attractive. So that means you want to experiment more with the risky action. And what that means is that your cutoff belief has to be lower. Another way uh, to decrease this cutoff belief is to increase the discount rate. However, how we're actually uh, decreasing the cutoff belief is via a different channel. Here, we've made the risky action more attractive instead of making the safe action less attractive. And the discount factor, what it does is it makes those future lump sums that potentially might be coming from the risky action more valuable. And the last way that I'm gonna go over for increasing this willingness to experiment is to increase the initial prior. Now, as you can see, this doesn't affect the cutoff belief at all, but it does affect the willingness to experiment because basically it's gonna take you longer to reach your cutoff belief. So the in intuition here is if you're more confident that the true state is good, you're gonna need more information to prove up, to convince yourself otherwise. So we go on to the experimental design. We necessarily need to go from continuous time to a discrete time implementation. And how we do that is we divide time into a discrete number of ticks. Now, each of our ticks is relatively short, so we are near continuous time, but we are still necessarily discrete. And we do other things for the discrete approximation. I'm not gonna go into them, just believe me that our discrete approximation does flow very closely to the continuous one. And we induce the discount factor by using a random stopping rule. So basically each tick is gonna have some probability of being the last tick. And we also restrict subject behavior. So we don't let subjects choose the risky action after choosing the safe action, because what we want here is to enforce a cutoff belief strategy, which is to choose the risky action first, and then at some point switch to the safe action. We also don't let subjects choose a safe action after observing a lump sum. Technically, this is to enforce the cutoff belief strategy, but this is more about not letting subjects make obvious mistakes. And the final thing that we don't let subjects do is to proceed to the next period before the last tick, despite the fact that their active decision might be over. Why we do this is because we want to equalize time spent in the lab for different kinds of strategies. So we don't want time spent in the lab as part of the subject's decision calculus. So we have four parameter sets, a baseline, and three other ones. And from this baseline, we change only one of these parameters in isolation, while keeping the other two parameters the same as the baseline. So obviously in the high prior, we raise the prior. In the low safe action, we lower the safe action. In the high discount factor, we raise the uh, discount factor. And uh, sorry, I had to check the chat. I was concerned you weren't uh, list. Uh, you couldn't hear me. So um, I'm sorry, you you've derailed me here. Oh, so the key point here is we change these parameters so that the increase in experimentation is the same for all of these different parameter changes. So we have subjects participate in only two of these blocks. The everyone participates in the in the baseline set and then they're gonna participate in one of these other three treatment sets. And we do those in, in 20 period blocks and we also randomize the block order to control for uh, any potential order effects. And we also really went out of our way to make sure subjects understood this environment. So in particular, we obviously wrote really good instructions, 
but they faced highly incentivized comprehension questions. We have a nice computer interface for them to use. And we also have a video like explaining the computer interface to the subjects. So we can move on to the results, but not quite yet. We need to talk about censoring. So the behavior that we're interested in is the subject's willingness to experiment with the risky action in the absence of a reward. But unfortunately, we don't always observe this because obviously if you get a reward, then you're not going to switch and we don't see when you would switch. But also if the period randomly ends before you actually switch over, we also don't see this. So we use two approaches to address this issue. First is the product limit estimator, and that's going to control for, a, sorry, correct for any censoring that's likely to occur. And the second approach is the subset approach where we only look at periods where the exploration is predicted to stop. So what this should do is reduce the amount of censoring we actually see. So the results I'm going to show you are from the subset approach, but our results are largely robust to either of these approaches. So I've got a, um, I'm going to graphically, uh, this is a graphical summary of my results. And if you recall, every subject participated in the baseline and one of the treatment sets. So we've got three types of sessions here. The blue bar is the baseline. The red is the uh, particular treatment. So we can see that when increasing the prior, we do see a small increase in experimentation that's statistically significant at the 10% level. But when we lower the safe action or increase the discount factor, we do see more substantial increases that's statistically significant at the 1% level. So our first finding here is we are finding support for the comparative statics of the model because they're predicted to increase the behavior. But something else we can look at is under, exp under experimentation. So we have these blue dashed lines and these red dashed lines. That shows the optimal level of experimentation. And you can just see visually, we're quite below those lines. Uh, so that in three of the four comparisons we make, it's statistically significant at the 1% level, with the other it's temp at the 10% level, but we are seeing this under experimentation. So that leads us on to estimating behavioral factors, because our results suggest that subjects are deviating from theory. Now the behavioral factors we propose, firstly is utility curvature, you might want to call this risk preferences, why we do that is, well, we have a safe arm and a risky arm. It makes sense that a uh, risk should come into this. The other, another behavioral factor we implement is the base rate neglect or conservatism. That's in belief updating. So basically, when you're pulling on the risky lever, your belief, uh, you're constantly updating your belief. So if you're updating your belief in some different way, that's obviously going to affect the time it takes you to hit the cutoff belief. So that could be an important behavioral factor as well. And we also consider nonlinear probability weighting because we do present certain parameters to subjects as probabilities. So they might be misweighting those probabilities. And what we do is we propose and estimate a structural model that incorporates these factors. So for utility curvature, we assume a simple CRA, or sorry, not a simple, a standard CRA utility function for any payoff. For nonlinear probability weighting, Basically, anytime there's a probability, we apply the prelet function to that, although it is robust to other probability weighting functions that we've tried. And for base rate neglect or conservatism, we assume that subjects treat one tick of experimentation as if they had psi ticks of experimentation. So if this is greater than one, then they're overweighting the information they're getting from each tick. If it's less than one, they're underweighting that information that they're getting from pulling on the risky action. So from this, we can get a closed form solution for the subject's current belief over time. And then via value function iteration, we can calculate the cutoff belief. So what our structural model is going to give us is it's going to give us a prediction of subject experimentation, which is going to be conditional on the parameter set and the various behavioral factors that were proposed. Now, this prediction is if subjects are about making uh, decisions without noise, but of course, experimental subjects do experiment, ex, ex, do exhibit noise. So per period, we assume a normally distributed error around that prediction. So that gives us another parameter that we need to estimate. So we get certain probability density function, and you'll note the similarity here to a sensor Tobit. 
So the cool thing is we get to use all of our data, unlike the previous uh, sort of approach. So that's more data is great, right? And what we do is with this density function, we use a maximum likelihood estimate te techniques to estimate the values for our behavioral parameters, as well as our standard deviation. And these are the results. So we do find evidence for risk aversion, conservatism, and inverse s shape probability weighting. And all of these parameters are roughly in line what, with what we would expect. Now, they are substantially underweighting the information from experimentation with the risky action. But uh, if we look back to an old paper by Griffin and Tversky, they do propose that if there is large samples of new information, which is the case here, that we would expect to see conservatism. So these are as we expect. And we also run likelihood ratio tests on various restrictions on the model. So what we can do with these parameters is we can consider the impact of these parameters. Uh, so what we're doing here is the parameter on the x-axis is uh, we vary that parameter while holding the other two parameters fixed at their estimated level. So the black square here is our estimated parameters. And then our red lines are the non-behavioral level. So looking at risk aversion, we can see that shutting off the risk aversion channel substantially increases experimentation. Whereas shutting off conservatism or shutting off probability weighting, they both uh, decrease experimentation. So from that, we can see that risk aversion is firstly swamping those other two effects, but that it also appears to be the main driver of our under experimentation because it is the only thing predicting under experimentation. So from the last thing we can do with this is look at how well our model does in predicting behavior because we our model does propose now that we have the parameters a prediction of behavior so we want to see how well that does. So against the treatments that we did run I've got the model predictions in red and the experimental results as blue crosses. So we can see that relative to the standard predictions, the model was doing better. However, that's not necessarily that surprising because that's what we uh, fit the structural model to. And what, why I'm showing you this is just that we're not fitting one parameter set at the expense of the others. What would be interesting is if we had another data set that was in a closely related environment. And fortunately, we do. So my co-author has this previous paper. And we can see that it has different parameters from what, our, what we use in the experiment. But we can see that our model is doing really well. So it seems like our model is doing OK, even out of sample. And it'll be cool to see some more results. But uh, you know, this is, this is what we have that's actually related to our environment. So just to wrap up here. What we do is we test a single agent exponential bandit model in a lab experiment. So as predicted, we find that subjects do respond to model parameters in the direction that we would expect. However, we find that subjects often under experiment. So what we do is we fit the structural model that incorporates behavioral factors. So utility curvature, base rate decay of conservatism and nonlinear probability weighting. And we find that subject behavior is consistent with risk aversion, conservatism, and inverse s shape probability weighting, and that risk aversion appears to be mainly driven by under experimentation. So I finished on time, which is really rare for me. Uh, yeah, I've seen the chat going crazy, but uh, hopefully nothing went wrong with the presentation. So thank you very much. Uh,